Exploring Abandoned Texas Under the Moonlight with the author of this book next. Hello, my friends. My name is Tim Little. I am a nighttime landscape artist living on the East Coast of Massachusetts. One of the things, hands down, that I have loved about this journey into night photography over the years is all of the people that I've met along the way, whether that's someone who's bought my work or other photographers that are kind of like-minded and appreciate that style. As is the case with the person we will be speaking with today, Mike Cooper, who is a Texas-based night photographer. I met him a few years ago. Since then, we've been on a few adventures together, but he's been busy. He's been putting thousands of miles on his vehicle and hundreds of hours under the moonlight to get this book done, Abandoned Texas, released November 2021. We're going to talk about how he got started in night photography, what his process has looked like, what he's shooting with for gear, and we're going to deconstruct a few of the pictures that are featured in his new book. All right. Well, Mike Cooper, hello, and thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. Well, you are the, uh, as we talked about, you're the guinea pig for this whole convoluted technological setup. <laughs> hey, I've been a guinea pig for any number of things. Uh, so all right. So you're used to it. You're okay with it. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I thought, what better time to talk about a a book than uh, right now because you've got one that's that's come out at this I point. I do. Yep, I do. And I have my my very own signed copy of Abandoned Texas, so I'm excited. I I took some notes. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> so we met on Flickr, I would say, right in 2015. Uh, yeah, I I I don't even remember how I came across you, your pictures. Uh, but I remember seeing some of yours and I think one of the things I'd first noticed was, uh, something about you were carting around some famous chair. How long before that had you been shooting at that point? Uh, so I, uh, the first time I had actually tried shooting at night would have been in 2010, uh, right around uh christmas new year's something like that uh my wife and daughter and i were on uh we were on vacation and uh i'd been thinking about it and i tried uh there was close to where we were staying there was a a, a large four or five foot tall buddha statue and i thought you know i'll just try that see what it looks like that's a great starting subject and, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, it was kind of, the statue was dark and I didn't have any equipment other than, uh, I think I was resting my camera on my camera bag, uh, that was on like a bench that was right there and I didn't have any sort of lighting. And so I was using the light from my Blackberry blackberry see now you're really dating yourself i know yeah blackberry uh, and <laughs> well, so that's what i was doing to light it and I, okay. I didn't have a shutter release so all i could do was take 30 second photos I, i'm curious like how does that conversation go with your family like that first time that you're just like i'm just gonna get up in the middle of the night and i'm gonna go out to this buddha statue and, and i'm gonna go take some photos like what's what's that like did they just kind of go Oh, all right. Good. Good luck with that. Uh, was there any concern? Uh, it, it was probably something like that. I think. I think I'd been talking about it a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, we had seen this statue, and so I said, "Boy, that would probably look really cool in the dark." And uh, there was probably a night or two that had passed before I'd even tried it, and. Uh, I guess we were going to bed one night and I said, you know what, I'm just going to get up and go try it and did. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's kind of just how it started for all of us. I think now was, yeah, probably, was, so. was there someone in particular that you had seen doing something like this before online or elsewhere that kind of got you thinking about the whole thing? 
Yeah. yeah so um, I had, uh, because it was winter time, mm-hmm. and at that time we were living in Kansas. So it, as you can probably guess, it's very cold. And uh, so in the evenings, I was frequently just sitting uh, in my wife's sewing room and I was just surfing the internet for you name it. Uh, I wasn't even really, I didn't really think of myself much as a photographer because uh, it was so cold. I couldn't go out in the garage and work on the car at all because the garage was cold. Right. And uh, I was at that time, I was still pretty heavily interested in route 66. Mm-hmm. And so I had, uh, you know, I'd probably done some sort of a Google search and uh, essentially I'd probably gone through enough screens that I came across some pictures of Troy Pavas. Yeah. I think the gateway for a lot of us with night photography was Troy Pava because I, I had the same experience and I couldn't even tell you what I was looking for the night I came across his work on the internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I remember emailing him. I was just so blown away with the actual website. I hadn't seen anything yeah. like it before, you know? So, uh, and he was pretty responsive and that was the nice thing about his his website at that time too was that you could look at something and you could kind of piece together how he did it but also there was a lot of information yeah. about the settings which was which was really helpful yeah. you know because for, oh yeah it was amazing yeah for someone who has never done that before and not you know let alone seen it um it's it's kind of mysterious obviously you you learned pretty quickly what it was that you were going to need that you didn't have yes. <laughs> at that point. Yeah. So what, it, what, at what point along that journey did you say, okay, now I've got to invest a little bit of money here. Maybe I got to move up on a camera or, you know, I got to get the lighting. Like when did that happen? Was that pretty quick or, or did you just kind uh, of build into it? It was probably right about that time. I'd kind of thought, okay, if I'm going to try this because I was kind of interested in it and I thought if I'm going to try this, I need to get some sort of basic equipment. So what I did was uh, because I wasn't sure if I was going to like it. So I went on eBay and I found uh, a flashlight similar to what Troy's website had uh, explained. And I found, I think like a four pack of Lee lighting. I think they were Lee uh, lighting gels. Then I also bought a, uh, uh, like a six dollar and fifty cent shutter release. <laughs> They're disposable uh, anyway. That's about the budget you yeah, should spend. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was at that time. I was using. Uh, I had the I, the cam. It was a Sony A three fifty. Okay. Which wow. Uh, I, I had gotten it. Uh, I'd been using a Minolta thirty five millimeter, and my wife had talked me into getting a uh digital the tripod that i was using was a uh, it was like a cheap 25 dollar velbon tripod that actually was a freebie when we bought a uh, a camcorder to record our daughter yeah oh i know those tripods oh, those those are the ones with the supporting uh middle legs there the, yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly what i know that those exactly ones. what it was yeah I think I used that tripod for like two years. Did so. you really? So you, you definitely got your money's worth out of that. Heck, if you'd oh. used that for a month, you would have had your money's worth out of it. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> so I know at some point then you, you moved on to Nikon. You you bought a, um, I don't want to say a grown-up camera, but you, you definitely made the upgrade leap. When was that? Because I was spending more time doing that. I'd started spending less time going out in the garage. And so uh, I had, I, I sold my my car that I'd been working on. And, uh, I took that money and put it towards a brand new, uh, Nikon D 800. The only reason I ended up doing that was because I had, um, I was thinking about getting either a, because I was using Sony. And so I thought why I should just stick with a Sony because that's what I've already been using. And there were so many uh, Nikon and Canon users anyway, I thought, you know, I'll be a little different. And so uh, I had contacted someone uh, also like you that I'd met on the internet. And 
Uh, he was in England and he, I knew that at that time he was working for Sony. Mm-hmm. And so I said, you know, I'm thinking about either getting uh, this Sony or that Sony, you know, which would be better for shooting at night. And so I got back. A, first, I got a very short email from him that said, I'll get back to you in a day or two with some information. OK. And then like a couple of days later, I got if you were to print it out like a three page letter from him. Really? Explaining, oh, yeah. He went through explaining what was good about the two Sony's I was looking at. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of went on to say, but if you're really serious about shooting at night, you might want to look at the Nikon D800. No kidding. And here's why. Wow. So uh, technically a Sony employee sort of recommended yes. a Nikon product which of course today yeah we wouldn't say anything about names but today that of course would not happen at all i suspect it could potentially be the other way around (laughs) for a lot of manufacturers considering how far sony has come in their their sensors you had at the time a job that would get you out to places and you would drive long distances in some cases and maybe drive Mm -hmm. by areas that you wouldn't normally they have a reason to drive by. So did you find that that was probably the biggest, um, the biggest reason you came across some of these places? Uh, some of the places, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, because frequently I would have to drive maybe hour, hour and a half for work. And uh, when I would then be coming back to wherever I was headed back to, uh, I would frequently take different roads. Uh, to get from point A to point B uh, just to see what was along that road. And there were quite a few times where I was on, um, uh, there was one time I came, I was on a dirt road and I actually came across a guy's house that uh, I stopped to chat with him and I ended up going back to his property I want to say four or five times. Now, was that uh, was that nice stop program. related to your job, or were you just no. driving by and said, I "Oh, I got to pop in here"? Really? So you know yeah. that that can be a risky prospect sometimes. You know, showing up uh, on yeah, someone's property. Yeah, I was kind of surprised when he told me it was okay for me to come back. Yeah how how did he react when you first you know pull, pulled up and kind of introduced who you were and what you were thinking? Uh. He was, I guess, a little confused. The guy was, uh, he was, I guess, older. He was probably in his Mm -hmm. Uh, seventies. He was pretty lively. I'll say that though, for being 70. Yeah. Uh, But I had, you know, I had a few pictures that I had printed so I could tell him, you know, here's what I'd like to do. Uh, I think I probably even told him, you know, pointed to something he had back in the yard and said, you know, I'd like to take some pictures of this. And then I showed him some pictures. Here's what I want to do right here. I want that to look like this. And that, that's a huge pro tip because traveling with pictures or samples, as mm-hmm. you already know, open up opportunities where if you just try Absolutely. to describe it to somebody, especially of a particular age, they it just might go right over their head so that was yeah. it was good that you had that because that's probably what got you in the in the door there oh yeah. yeah and a lot of times i'll like now if i'm stopping to talk to someone the you know the little stack of pictures that i'll keep with me if it's say say if it's a house that i'm wanting to take pictures of mm-hmm. i'll go through my photos and put all the house photos on top smart so that when i when i pull them out i can say here's a house Right. Yeah, that's a and then that's a great thing. picture. Okay, that's what my house would look like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and plus, it implies that that's that's the thing that you do, as opposed yes. to going through a bunch of cars and and boats and bathrooms right. and then oh and oh here's this random house you know so that's that's another good pro right. tip plan ahead, put the relevant yeah. content on top. The social engineering aspect of it is hugely important if you want to get into a place yeah. that. Um, that looks interesting and you don't want to get in trouble. You know, we've done, you and I have done a lot of shoots in places where, you know, maybe we should not have been there, but there didn't seem like there'd be anybody around who would necessarily care, you know, but that adds that whole extra level of, you know, Oh, what was that noise? Oh, are those headlights over there? (laughs) You know, you're always watching your back. So, Uh, yes. And uh, there obviously are, uh, some inherent dangers to it in that 
the police can show up. Sure. So uh, the being someplace you're not supposed to be does have its downsides because like me, there then would be the potential that you could get handcuffed and then spend a couple hours trying to talk your way out of the handcuffs. Right. Yeah. As not a great way to end an evening. No, not at all. And, and I have heard of that happening uh, to other people on, yeah. you know, military bases too, all sorts of random stuff. <laughs> yeah. So well, you have people that don't like you being there. Yeah. You, you kind of want to avoid that. And I know when we, we go out West a lot, the whole idea of, uh, of that is the metal scrapping, you know, just depending on where you are in the country will depend on, uh, or will dictate what people think you're doing. You know, so if you're yep. out West, you're looking for metal. You're, you're going to, you know, cut down signs or, you know, maybe if you're down where you are, you're going to be ripping out copper pipes. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But yeah, the, when, when the sheriff showed up, that's what uh, that's what they thought I was doing was uh, stealing copper. I think the most recent run in I had was uh, uh, just a month ago where uh, the, the person that lived next to where I was set up, they had a dog that wouldn't stop barking. Oh, you got to love those barking dogs because they hear everything <laughs> and they do not stop barking. Yeah, he was not happy. Right. So the owner of the property, well, the owner of the property next door, he came out, uh, wanted to know what I was doing. Uh, I'm sure when I told him, he probably thought it's impossible to take a picture in the dark, uh, which is very common, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I have one. Of, I had one of those run-ins with another person, yeah. and the guy had a, a white pickup truck with a shotgun rack, and he's like, "You can't take no what pictures at night." <laughs> Well, obviously, you know, for anybody who's uh, watching this, be careful is the uh, the, the safety yes. there. Bring samples. Be nice. Be aware of your surroundings. Get permission if you can. Because then again, Absolutely. if you're there with permission, you don't have that, that you know, what's going on behind your back. And that helps mm -hmm. with your creativity, too, because now if oh, you hear yeah. a noise or whatever, you don't really have to worry about it all that much. You can literally focus on the mission. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So now you're moving ahead a couple of years. You, you've been running all over. You were living in Louisiana at the time. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So at the time, at that time, uh, I was living in Louisiana. Um, and uh, the, uh, the one thing that you would find down there a lot of is uh, shotgun houses and uh, a, a lot of uh, – uh, there were a few plantations down there as well um, that were actually abandoned, surprisingly enough. Yeah, I was I was surprised at how much seems to be abandoned down there. Your first book mm -hmm. obviously yeah. featured all of that because it was all about Louisiana. And uh, mm -hmm. quite frankly, I was amazed. I just living up here in New England, we don't have a lot of abandonment around here that lasts all that long. It's usually because right. an apartment burned down and then they just knocked the rest of it down in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but out where you have been, it seems like this stuff, you know, obviously is just there through the decades and, yeah. and relatively untouched too. It looks like. Uh, yeah. A lot of it is um, the, the downside to Louisiana was that because it rains there so much, mm -hmm. you know, like anything else, once the roof starts having structural problems, then the water can get inside the the structure itself. It gets to the floor. Uh, there were quite a few houses that I would go into, and you know, as soon as you put your foot on the floor, you can you can feel it give way an inch or two. Uh, so then you really have to be careful about where you stand uh, if you even go inside at all, because you know the last thing you want to do is fall through a floor. Yeah, by yourself at night. Um, yeah. maybe in an area where you, you might not have cell coverage. And then what about, you know, molds? Do you ever worry about that sort of thing? Or was that not really the environment for it based on the construction? Uh, most of the places I was in never really had, at least not that I saw. Sure. Uh, not a lot of mold. Now you would get a lot of, uh, trees, you know, everything would get overgrown pretty quickly. Yeah, sure. Um, but not really a lot of mold. So you, you've at this point, you've had, um, you're on your second book, which is the, the one we're going to talk about today is the one that you are just coming out with now. It's officially been released. Is that right? 
the 22nd is when it will it, it's actual release date is okay in november ah okay all right so it's it's abandoned texas and mm-hmm. um you have since moved to texas from louisiana yes. and if i recall and you know correct me if i i'm wrong but with the the first book what you had ended up doing was because you were trying to get content for the louisiana book you were mm-hmm. doing a lot of driving back yes. to louisiana to get more of that on the weekends that i would drive there to shoot i was probably getting 1500 to 2000 miles maybe um, holy moly <laughs> and probably 1500 was maybe to the outside yeah um i hope the gas prices were good at the time yeah uh, they they were less than they are now yeah yes. it'd be a little prohibitive so you you did that with with louisiana and then the the texas book came along so how did that how did that process start like how did a book even end up on the the table for you to begin with uh so it's actually pretty funny so um if you've ever gotten a facebook message from someone that you don't know uh you kind of have to go look for it and uh must have been i'm gonna say maybe mid-february of 2019 i had uh so I was looking around on Facebook and I was in the messenger and, and I saw something about there was like a message waiting or something like that. And so I went and clicked on it and it was uh, a message from somebody at Fawn Hills Media. And he was asking if I was interested in doing the book of abandonment and if I was to contact him. And my first thought was, Okay, I'm. This is some sort of a scam <laughs> that someone's trying to bilk all my money out. Yeah, of just me. send us a few dollars and we'll make a yes. whole book for you. You know, yeah, yeah. And so I thought, okay, this is can't be a real thing. And so I googled the place and oh, wow, this is actually a real publishing real deal. company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I I had uh, asked someone else that I knew and they and was told, Oh yeah, I I have a book deal with them too. So you moved to Texas and you've already gotten your, your other book done. And now it's time to focus on, on Texas. Did you at that point already have a catalog going in terms of what you thought you might put in that book? Or was this sort of, um, you know, it's time to get on mission and get out there and start getting all those shots. Uh, I had some, um, not, not, a, I mean, I guess I had quite a few, but I had some. Cause you, when you were living uh, in Louisiana, were you driving out to Texas at all at that point? Or were you, is that too, a little bit too far out of your radius? No. There's no radius. Who are we kidding? Uh, that's right. <laughs> uh, when we were living in Louisiana, I had actually made one trip, uh, and gone, to texas um and went across uh 66 and the route 66 in the panhandle and shot a whole bunch up there and then uh had photographed a few places when i was uh that was south of there Uh, so i had a some but the one thing i kind of wanted to do with the texas book was uh have fewer have, have fewer photos of a, of a single place you know not have say four or five pictures of one location oh right so and, spread out the subject matter more, a little bit yes yeah. more limited to maybe one or two photos of each place right so that there was a bigger variety what i noticed too it, uh, probably the biggest difference was the amount of research you did on each of these locations um you know i i have a book other people you know have a book have books and we all kind of do this thing where it's like oh, here's a gas station by the highway <laughs> you know that's our that's our title right? Right, right right uh so i was i was impressed when i opened up this book and i saw like well here's this building and this is when it was built and this is what it was used for and then it was later used for this and this is when they stopped using it and i was like wow so how does that 
how does that happen in terms of the the amount of research? It, was that mostly internet or you know pulling up resources? Yeah. How how did that all come about? Because that that seemed like a lot of work, uh, maybe even more work than going out and getting all those photos. For whatever reason, Texas documents their history, even if it seems like it's pretty minor. They they do a fantastic job of documenting all their history. So uh, a lot of the places. Uh, obviously from the book, a lot of the places I was able to access, I think it was uh, Texas online and there was another resource I used quite a bit and you could find a lot of information about them. Uh, there were some places that uh, were even somewhat well known. So there were even web pages dedicated to that one particular place. It was interesting from a historical standpoint, because you, you break the book up into different sections and, and you have a section on like churches. And, mm -hmm. and I found that really interesting uh, because there's a whole history in other parts of the country that I'm completely unaware of because I've just either never visited or I've just not had access to, to, to any of that information or, or reason really to look at it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I found really great about the book was that it was almost, um, besides the great photographs, educational. There are many great photos in the book that I probably would have would have had a hard time choosing from. But the first one that I want to talk about is the one that I think is my, my absolute favorite. Do you have any idea which one you think that one is out of the I'm three you sent me? I'm guessing it's probably the outlaw gas station. Oh, it's not. <laughs> No, oh. no, that, that's a good one for different okay. reasons. But the one that I think is the most sort of um, psychedelic has got to be this one. Ah, uh, yes, the future yeah. house. This is a fantastic shot because it's such an amazing subject. So those are actually, uh, I think they're, I think they were built by the Swedes or the Finnish or someone. Okay. Uh, you're someplace over in Europe. And they were called Futuro houses. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of them built, but they're an actual house. Uh, and kind of to the, I guess, to the left side of the structure itself, you can sort of see the stairs uh, that are kind of down uh, to the ground. Uh, and so you would then, uh, when you, like, say, went in to go to bed at night, you would pull those stairs up so that you could lock the door basically just like you would with a regular house except just, this thing is round and looks like a spaceship yeah just like if you were actually going to be getting onto your ufo and leaving earth yes. to go somewhere else yeah exactly exactly yeah. and and i really I, I really love the future house that was actually uh the second time i had photographed that yeah um the first time i went there uh it was a it was a beautiful night because it was clear. There were no clouds at all. Uh, and when I got back home and put the pictures into the computer, I realized that I had the focus off. Oh, that that's ter terrible. How far away were you on that night from from you know where you, where uh, you were living? Let's see. So that would have been uh, the first time I was there. We were actually living in Louisiana. And so this was probably six, seven hours away. Oh, you know, you can fix so many things after the fact, thanks to post-processing. But the one thing you yeah. cannot fix is focus. Is focus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, that is, that is well, a bummer. <laughs> oh. So tell us a little bit about what, what went into this, this shot in terms of, uh, you know, how you did the, the lighting. I see obviously the interior light source, um, and there's some exterior lighting as well. How much of this was, were you responsible for as far as that went? Uh, so primarily I was responsible for the blue. Okay. Um, the, uh, the first time I had been there and photographed it, uh, as you can kind of see, there are some shadows that are kind of trailing off to the right side of the image. Yeah. Um, so the first time I was there and had photographed it, there, the, that area was almost completely dark. Uh, but since I was there, there's been a business that's opened up to what it would be camera left and they've got some really bright lights. So you can, 
uh, kind of by one of those windows, you can even see, I guess there's a couple windows, you can kind of see a shadow of something kind of circling around. Oh yeah, you uh, definitely can. I can see what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, and those are lights that are come feeding in from uh, this business that's opened up nearby. Okay. All right. And were they, um, were they like those horrible sodium vapor lights? Did you have to do some correction or were they just white lights that you could work with? They were white floodlights, basically. Uh, okay. Fortunately, they were not sodium vapor, but there were quite a few. But the flip side to it was that uh, it did give me some neat shadows and it also lit one side of it quite a bit. Sure. And the other side was kind of in the dark, which I was really pretty happy with because it, it kind of helped give it the shape. Yeah. And you've got some nice texture on the side of it there. And then the shadows that are hitting the, uh, the outside of the structure, cause they're curved, they just work really well with the windows so that it all kind of pieces itself together in that way and keeps the, the circles and the curves going, which is really neat. Is this a single shot or did you do multiples? No, uh, that is a single shot. So that the reason I asked this question is because a lot of people, including myself, uh, we're always curious about how people do their, their processing and their shooting. And the one thing mm -hmm. that stands out about how you do all of your work, I have found, is that you try to nail everything in one shot so that you're not I, working with the layer masks or the focus stacking or any of that later. Um, I've, and I've seen you work before where you're taking the same shot multiple times to get the lighting just right, where in other cases and including myself in, in many cases now, I feel like I'm on a time crunch and I'm going to do the lighting from a couple different angles and, and call it a day and then move on mm -hmm. and then do some layering later. So that's, that's what makes this impressive is that you'll, you'll just keep shooting it until you get it right basically. Yeah. That's probably my biggest weakness is I don't understand, uh, I, which I'm learning, but I, I don't know a lot of the layer masking and all that stuff in Photoshop. So, uh, I kind of have to rely on figuring out, figuring out what to do in camera to make it look usable. So, but that, I wouldn't say it was, it would be a weakness. It forces you to do something that other artists and photographers yeah now don't do you, you know that some people will just build a photo out of five or six right it, which is fine because it, it's it's art but there's something really personally gratifying about being able to just do it in one shot and say i did mm -hmm. this in one shot and we're kind of in a world now where when you tell that to people they don't always believe you because when they look at something they think they start trying to pick apart the photoshop elements of it mm -hmm. Uh, because that's that's the world we live in, where mm -hmm. people on Instagram and social media will take a sky from a completely different night, drop it in a foreground, and whammo, presto, you've got this photo that everybody loves. But it was digitally created, and th that field work wasn't really done. You are someone who loves to travel with cardboard. What are you using the cardboard for in your shooting? Uh, I frequently will use it to, uh, as strange as it sounds, it, it's got a lot of uses, uh, but you can use it if say you're wanting to, uh, light something, say you want to light something from the side of it, but you can't light it up next to it without your light showing up in the camera. You can actually hold the cardboard between you and the camera far enough away that if you hold your light next to you, you can shine it on your subject and basically have the light aimed at the camera and you'll never even see the cardboard. Ah, okay. So you're, you're using it to direct the light somewhat in yeah. a particular way and then not have it spill off in, in other directions. Mm -hmm. You're, you're doing something that people would do digitally you're you are um field masking <laughs> as opposed to layer yes. masking yes which in and of itself is is fantastic because again you're you're doing a practical application um during the during the exposure yeah and and shockingly enough the cardboard works great uh i've used it 
on like if there's a building that has windows, mm -hmm. you can use it on windows. Uh, I've lit different parts of the window, like kind of hide it on one window, light it, and then move the cardboard to another part and light that. And essentially your light from the first will kind of wash out the darkness of that first one. Ah, okay. So that, so that you don't even really notice that you've actually done that. Right. Well, that is very, very creative. When did you figure this out? Um, years ago. Years ago. So uh, cardboard or some sort of uh, flat something is probably just as important to you as maybe having your tripod. Uh, yeah. I, 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 in my car, I keep a chunk of cardboard all the time. <laughs> that that's amazing. I'm I'm pretty confident you're the only one that I've encountered who proactively uses cardboard in that way, but to to genius effect. So, you know, it's it's a way to recycle, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. This box grew up to be a light painting tool. Tell me what the heck is this? So, this is it uh, it was a gas station. Okay. Uh it was also a speakeasy. And uh, you could, uh, at one time, supposedly, this particular business sold more liquor during Prohibition than they sold gas. Could you define, for people who may not know, what is a speakeasy? Uh, a speakeasy would be a place where you would uh, get illegal liquor. Ah, you'd, you'd go there and would you buy it and like run away with it? Or it, was there a secret room somewhere and you'd go have a fun time in the secret room? Uh, you know, I'm not sure since I wasn't there. Good but answer. I think, yeah. I think generally you would buy it and leave. There's not a lot left to this building, it looks like. But wow, what an interesting place. Yeah. I mean, the brickwork it, is amazing. Uh, yeah, it's got bricks and it also has stone and this would be what we're looking at would be the front of the station uh, and then the big arch that's kind of to the left would be where you could uh, like pull through or pull under an awning because there would have been a roof over that part. Oh, okay. Sort of like a <laughs> drive through liquor store. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. And then. Kind of, you can sort of see the large openings there through that archway. Uh, that was where the actual like gas station slash speakeasy was behind there. Uh, and it was actually, um, there's obviously no roof left, but right. it's actually a large, I mean, it's a sizable building overall it's it's a lot bigger than what you think yeah sure so i noticed for this shot it looks like you may have used the fisheye because i'm seeing looking at the I telephone did. pole and i'm seeing how it's kind of bowed out a little bit yeah. there probably worked out really well for that that sort of um exaggerated corner angle uh and it, the side effect of course is it, it does tend to make the buildings look a little bit on the the smaller side um at least from that vantage point uh sure. while really enhancing the, the front end of it. But, but when you, when you go up to a place like this and you kind of scout it out and you got all your lenses and everything, what, what makes you think, ah, oh, you know what, this is a, this is a fisheye location as opposed to a, you know, regular old 15 to 30 or wide angle lens. Uh, probably most of the time is, uh, like on this particular location, when I first got there, I had shot probably, I probably did four or five setups with the 15 to 30 mm -hmm. nice wide angle. Um, I think most of them you would probably to some degree call the postcard shot where, right. you know, that's the angle you want. Yeah. And uh, when I got done shooting those, uh, I had kind of thought because of the arches that this thing has, it would probably look really interesting with the fisheye. Uh, so I slapped the fisheye on it. Uh, I think I did maybe, I don't know, two, three setups. I think this one was actually one of the first ones I did. Uh, and, you know, it was one of those things where you're standing there holding the cam, you know, holding the camera up to your head when it's mattered to a tripod, walking around, trying to look what you see through the, yeah. uh, 
you know, through the viewfinder. And uh, I think I ended up getting just, you know, a couple feet away from it, which was where I was getting the most twisty, Weird, bizarre weirdness. look. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are you using for your your lighting equipment when you're out doing these shots? Are you bringing multiple lights? Is there a light that you're relying on primarily for the, the colors? Like, what's your go-to? Uh, so, uh, I, years ago, I graduated from using a flashlight and, uh, colored gels yep. and I got myself, uh, what's called a proto machines, which are pretty well known. Uh, and, uh, mine, the one that I have is the original series. So, uh, it kind of looks like a dust buster mm -hmm. in many ways. I'm going to put a picture up of, on this so people can see exactly what okay. it looks like because uh, okay. I guarantee they've never seen it before. <laughs> no, I'm sure not. Yeah. Uh, so I'll use uh, my Proto Machines LED one. And um, honestly, most of the time when I'm choosing a color, uh, it's, I would say, maybe 10% of the time do I go someplace and have an idea already in my mind of what color I'm going to use. Uh, usually what ends up happening is I'll show up at a location uh, like that particular photo. I'd already been there for, I bet, probably an hour and a half, maybe close to two hours at the point I'd taken this one. Uh, and so when I set the camera up and opened the shutter, it was more a matter of me thinking, okay, what color haven't I used yet? Because I need to use something different. Sure. And so that was the color I ended up using problem i have is i tend to always default to using green and so i <laughs> you are known I for your green plan. yeah <laughs> I, I struggle with that so i have to think of other colors to use because well okay this looked really great with green but i should use something else yeah uh, and, and this color is is good for that because it's it's still in the it family is. of uh mm -hmm. green that you might like but with a little bit of extra yeah. kick to it yes you know? exactly um, so you mentioned the the proto machine. Are there any other lights that you carry? Do you have a light for walking around or something for hitting long distances? Or uh, I've got uh, a couple small flashlights, just handheld ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a little headlight that I'll strap on my head. So uh, if I'm walking somewhere out in the middle of the desert and it's dark, I can actually see where I'm walking and not stepping yeah. around. Oh yeah, that that'd be exciting. You're, basically, it's like a logistics light. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. something you might use for light painting, depending, but mostly you're yeah. using it for walking around. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes uh, I use I will use it sometimes if I'm shooting like inside a dark building mm -hmm. where there's no other light source. Yeah, I'll turn it on and aim it the other direction, mm -hmm. or uh, sometimes I'll cover it with like a paper towel just to, just to dim, dim it enough so it's just a very dim light. Mm -hmm. so, so that I can see, but not actually light the area. Sure. Yeah. Oh, paper towel. Okay. So you're you're basically creating a diffuser yeah. out of just household like material. Coffee cups too. Yeah. Coffee cups work great too because they're pretty solid. Right. So I I was just at a workshop with someone who brought a. I think they are they are the like prescription pill bottles. Those brownish ones yeah, the brownish ones. and it just fit over his light perfectly and created an amazing effect and you know just just for wow. people out there who think oh i gotta go blow a ton of money on gear and lighting and everything you really can look around your house and find a bunch of stuff like a piece of oh, cardboard yeah. you know or yeah. a paper cup or a prescription pill bottle yeah you, you do uh, have a the lot first of time I used, the first time i used a uh, a coffee cup was when uh we were in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, wherever the yellow dog was. And it just so happened that I knew because we were going to be shooting uh, inside houses quite a bit, I was trying to think of what I had in the motel room that I could use to diffuse this. And, you know, the coffee maker was sitting right there. So I picked up one of the coffee cups and the, the light that I had at that time, uh, I stuck it over it and it was like a perfect fit. So I would just stick it over the the coffee cup over the end of the light and then set the light uh, on the windowsill and it worked great. Yeah. Um, by the way, for people who don't know, Yellow Dog was the name of a small town, not an actual dog. Not a dog. <laughs> we were not light yes, painting we animals. Paint a dog. 
<laughs> yeah. No animals were harmed in the making of any photographs. Right, exactly. We weren't chasing a yellow dog around with a cup in the middle of the night. <laughs> uh, we we shot recently with a with a gentleman from California who has been experimenting with fiber optic brushes. Yeah. And that was really fascinating to to see that that idea in action. Yeah, it was interesting what effects he was getting with that. I was kind of blown away that it would do that. Yeah, yeah, it really is. So again, just goes to show that you've got a lot of options, especially at night, because <laughs> you've you've got a a blank palette on which to do anything oh, you yeah. want with whatever light you're going to put wherever. Do you find that with having so many options on that that proto machine? Do you find that you have to sort of act responsibly because not all of the colors can be reasonably printed? To me, the pink is a touchy color. Mm. And the, the, the teal that's on this one, uh, for whatever reason, it, the times I used it in the book, uh, it doesn't show up as well. It's almost like it just disappears. Yeah, and a lot of times I'll I'll even uh, like say maybe well the one of the Futuro house mm -hmm. I think I when I taken photos of it I think I used like for that particular angle I think I used two maybe three different colors just to see which one I liked the best and sure. it ended up like this one you know it ended up where the, I thought the blue looked the best and to your eye when when you shot this. Um, is this the blue that you expected on this particular shot when you, you know, yes. were using it? So it pretty much ended up right where you thought it would. Yeah. How did this end up being your, your book cover? Was this a decision that, um, you made or did they make it or, you know, what, what was the process for this? I had chosen, uh, I can't even remember for sure what they were, uh, towards them for one of them actually was at the outlaw station. Not, not the photo we were looking at, but, yeah. and I thought for sure that was going to be the one they were going to choose for the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular picture, it was almost an afterthought in that I had four photos for the cover and I thought, okay, I ought to have a, a, a fifth. And I thought, you know, I'll just throw that one in because I'd taken it in portrait mode for the, for the exact reason of having something to submit for a book photo. Sure. And uh, that was when I was shooting that location, that was actually the picture I took right before uh, I threw all the stuff in the car and drove off. And I was probably walking by and thought, you know what, I had to just take one of that doorway. And so I set stuff up, you know, I was probably grumbling. I shouldn't even be doing this and set it up and focused <laughs> it. And, uh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, I would guess I probably took maybe one or two and I, I did a little bit of lighting on, uh, the inside with, uh, I just used some yellow from the inside to catch some of those, uh, openings a little bit. Uh, so they would show up okay. better. Yeah. That was going to be one of my questions because I, I wanted to kind of get an idea of what the lighting situation was here. Sometimes, you know, you, you already previewed on another shot that there's lighting nearby. You're getting some ambient mm -hmm. lighting. And this yeah. I'm looking at, and I, I feel like it could go either way. You know, either there was a street light nearby or you did a little bit of something. Cause I'm seeing on the shot is it looks like there's a light source coming from inside the building. And then it looks like there may be a light source coming from outside as well. Yeah. Uh, there was a light, uh, to camera, right. That was across the street and maybe, uh, I'm gonna say maybe 50 yards down. Oh, okay. So was uh, that a street street light? Yeah, it was a street okay. light. Uh, it was feeding some light into the subject. Uh, fortunately, because it was a sodium vapor light, it was kind of a nasty light. Right. But fortunately, it was just far enough away that it wasn't really interfering with the picture. Uh, if anything, it, it probably was just kind of a neutral because the color of the building was such that it didn't really, you know, it didn't re really detract from it. I didn't no, it, it really doesn't. I mean, it all kind of blends all the, the tones work well. And that's why yeah. I couldn't really tell if it was something that you had done or if it was just around there. The, the, yeah, it just had to be where I was at. So when you when you did the lighting in the inside, I'm assuming mm -hmm. that's that's the proto machine. 
that you had used? Yes. And, and, yes that was the program. And was that actually, I walked up, I walked up the steps, okay. uh, and hopped down into what would have been the floor and then shined it through the, the lights there in the front. And did you use just a, like a warm light or did you try to tune it to be relatively close to what you saw coming from down the road? Uh, I think I'd actually used yellow. Mm -hmm. um, frequently, if I want something that will almost resemble, like, say, a, uh, a house light, yeah. I'll use yellow because it kind of has that same look to it, almost a, almost a natural look. Yeah, like that incandescent. Let's just say a green or a blue. Right, right. Sort of like a like an incandescent color. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I have on on my light. I tuned it. I had, I had a mag light that I was using for years that had a nice warm incandescent bulb on it. So I mm -hmm. shined that on a white wall and then tuned the proto machine to be just about the same. And okay. I find that I use that almost all the time. It's up here in New England when I'm doing the light painting. For me, it's a lot of natural like ground stuff or trees. You know, I'm not going to blast fuchsia on a tree <laughs> or you know teal on the grass. Um, so oh, I, I know crazy, right? Cause I may print it. No, but I, I think, oh, yeah, I, sure. I think that's the light I use the most and, and it's a underestimated in terms of how much impact it can have, even though it's mm -hmm. not the, the brightest or most amazing of colors. Sometimes, Sometimes all you need is just a little bit and, and a little dab will do <laughs> a little, a little dab will do a uh, brill cream. Is that I what, is that what it is. was? <laughs> I think so. So you, you, so you picked five, you submitted five images mm -hmm. for the cover and then did they say, okay, here's the one, or did they bounce it back to you and say, okay, now of those five, what do you think? Uh, they, they chose, uh, I, I submitted everything. And then I want to say maybe, well, it might've been three months later, uh, they sent me a image of here's what your cover looks like. Okay. And I had that. On. Oh, okay. So you, you were just as surprised as the next person then. <laughs> oh, I, yes, I was. Yeah. And when they sent it to me, it had the, uh, it had the printing of, uh, abandoned Texas under a Lone Star Moon. It had all that already. Yeah superimposed on it. Okay. So that they probably looked at, at the way the words fell on the different ones that you sent over and figured out that it probably had the most impact. Yeah, they probably did. Yeah. They probably Yeah. Did. No, it was it's an excellent choice because um the way the words end up on the, going across the cover and how it interacts with the the photo, uh you know, sometimes yeah. you end up with with pictures that just kind of blend in and they don't quite look right. And this worked out mm -hmm. really well because that bottom area where the ground is um, was the perfect place for the words. And yeah. then you get the preview behind it. Do you have cookie cutter camera settings that you're running out and using in most scenarios because your conditions are usually pretty much the same? Or are yeah. you sort of tweaking them as, as needed? A little of both. Okay. Uh, as a general rule, I have my settings are almost always my default is... Uh, uh, F 5.6, mm -hmm. uh, 100. And I think I usually have my white balance set at about 3,400. Okay. Uh, and then most of the time I'll shoot, uh, I, I, if at all possible, I'll shoot for three minutes, do a lot of three minute exposures because I like the star trails I'll get. Yeah. Um, and so generally speaking, like if I show up at a place and I'm going to take a picture, I'll get it set up, I'll get it focused. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just go ahead and at those settings, fire off a three minute shot. I may even go throw a little light on it just to see mm -hmm. you know, if it soaks the light up or if it just blows it sure. out. I feel like when you go into your situations, you're pretty much under the same conditions. Your, your window of photography is within a certain amount of days of the full moon. Typically, mm -hmm. you don't do yes. um, a lot of astro, high ISO, wide aperture mm -hmm. stuff. You're really focused on the moon stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're doing that and you're in these places that, you know, the conditions are probably the same all the time. You probably don't have a lot of lights around. You're not in a really urban environment. Mm -hmm. You can rely on your settings. When we first started this conversation, you told me that you had gone from a Sony to a Nikon. 
but we didn't really mm-hmm. touch base on on where you're at now. Where are you now with your gear? Uh, so so uh, I've moved from uh, the Nikon to a Pentax K1, mm-hmm. um, partially because, well, I, I used to shoot Sony, so I have no allegiance to anyone. Um, but the, the Pentax seemed to have, uh, it was the, when you set your camera up and it's dark, the Pentax seems to gather the light more to see better on your viewfinder. Oh, the live, yeah, the live view is, is good. Yeah. The live view, it, it's yeah. amazing. Uh, and so, uh, and I've even found myself that if I, uh, if I'm in a particularly dark spot and I can't tell, I need to really, before I shine any light on it to focus it, I need to dial that power down pretty low mm-hmm. because if I have it up where I might normally have it and I put light on there, it'll just blow out that live view where you can't see anything. Yeah. And, um, and that's hugely helpful at, at night, especially because you're probably using your live view to do some of your focusing. I'm thinking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I, and that was, I was going to say, I've seen a lot of people with Nikons before and you know, the, the mm-hmm. older body ones and they don't have great low light live view at all. No, Please terrible. don't message under this on, on the YouTube telling me how great it is and how I just <laughs> insulted your camera because that was not my intention, but I, the Nikon stuff is not that great. The newer stuff is, is probably pretty good, especially the mirrorless. But when you're talking about yeah. a full framed DSLR, you know, f- like the old cameras, yeah, yes. that live view is pretty darn good on the Pentax. Yeah, it is. It really is. And, and, uh, that was a big selling point. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, they, uh, because the Pentax K1 has the Astro Tracer, uh, not that I'm using it yet, but that was something that, you know, if I want to move that direction some and start playing with it, Hey, it's there. Right. Uh, and, uh, the other big thing was because it has an internal envelometer, mm-hmm. uh, that was one thing I wasn't going to have to carry with me, although I still carry it. I don't necessarily have to get it out of the bag and plug it in Yeah. only to find out when I open the shutter that it wasn't plugged all the way in yeah. and didn't you know. work as advertised. Yeah. yeah. That, and that yeah. for me, because I have the K one was the biggest feature that I loved, uh, you know, having shot with an intervalometer and a shutter release cable for so many years to have a camera that doesn't require that feels like cheating. It feels like it's the future, you know, and yeah, it is. Pretty and nice. there's still some cameras out there. There's some Sony's out there that if you don't have the shutter release, you're not doing those long exposures. Um, that part of it they need to catch up with. But almost everything yeah. coming out now with Live View, you can even do the tap to start and and tap to stop. The book is Abandoned Texas Under a Lone Star Moon. And where can the folks currently pick this up or order it from? Uh, online or do you have a website or where should they track this Uh, down? I do not have a website, but it is ready, readily available for order through Amazon. Uh, I'm sure there are many other fine retailers that it can be found at. You mentioned you don't have a website, but I know that people can find you elsewhere. Uh, And where is that? Uh, so I have a page on Flickr that pretty much everything shows up on. Okay. Uh, and I can be found there by the name of Nocturnal Kansas. And, uh, I have an Instagram page also, and I can be found on Instagram at Nocturnal Kansas in Texas. Nocturnal Kansas in Texas. Okay. I will put those in the video description below so people can click on those. Any plans at any point to maybe do a website or not really something on your, your radar at this point? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Knows. I mean, I keep thinking about it. Maybe so. I mean, just haven't got it. Around yeah. Yet. You know, a lot of people are just using social media for getting their work out and yeah. that's fine. I think for most people, that's more than enough. And really, Mm -hmm. it seems to be, you know, depending on who you ask, websites, you know, are, especially for photographers, are they useful or not? 
Right. You know, right. there's right. a demographic yeah. out there that will still just go to websites and they don't have social media, but it's a very small one. Yeah, yeah. yeah it probably is. And yeah. And getting small. Yeah. One. Any future plans for any other books or was this, this it? Or can you not no. tell me? Because if it's a secret, I don't want to ruin anything. Just, just tell me to mind my business and we uh, have this. <laughs> no, uh, there's no more plans. See, I've, okay. I've got the, uh, the bookends for the Under a Moon series, so there's no reason to have any. More. Okay. I'm, I'm just do. I've, I've done uh, the abandoned Texas now, so it's a mic drop, and I'm walking off the stage. Ah, okay, it's a mic drop. I like that. Yes. Yeah. I- <laughs> Double meaning there. Uh, unless maybe you move to another state at some point and then there might be. Uh, nah, no, no. Well, nah, that, I know, think I'm done. Well, you, I'm you done. never know. You never know. But OK, so we won't look for anything in the immediate near future other than your uh, current book and your last yes. book, the one for Louisiana. That can be found mm-hmm. where? Same places? Uh, yeah, same places. Uh, obviously all the random places that you find books, yeah. probably even eBay as far as that goes. I haven't, although I haven't looked, I should go look. Thanks again. And I look Thank forward you. to seeing you in the future, in the field on whatever random trip we take next. Uh, I'm ready. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Have a good one. All right.